Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm going to start with some opening remarks, and then I'm going to turn to Huang, Tai, and Heather for their opening remarks. I want to welcome everyone to the Porn Star After OnlyFans and Sesta Fosta, a panel that hopes to ask good questions and identify transformations with regards to porn figuration, stardom, and fandom in the context of changing regulations and production environments. The porn star, as we understand it, is a recognizable erotic performer and quasi-celebrity whose name, body, and image are highly enchanted, exchanged, and desirable, both erotically and economically. At times, the porn star has been someone who can cross out of porn into more mainstream contexts. Think here a Gemma Jameson or Asa Kira. At times, they've been someone who dominates the porn landscape for years on end, but doesn't touch the mainstream. Think here a Johnny Rapid or an Armand Rizzo. Either way, the porn star has been porn's key emblem for at least the last 50 years. In the early 20th century, whose porn landscape was populated by stag films, peep show loops, and private image collections, porn performers were often nameless, faceless, underpaid, or unpaid. As our panelist Heather Berg writes in her new book, Porn Work, Sex, Labor, and Late Capitalism, porn stardom is a recent invention, and it looms larger in most stories about porn than in the day-to-day -day experience of working. The porn star as we know it generates in the golden age, usually dated from 1969 to 1984, where feature length pornography and a relatively strong infrastructure of distribution and public viewing allowed for porn performers to gain something like celebrity status. These are the days of Linda Lovelace, Marilyn Chambers, and Casey Donovan, and even their remediation into the fictional Dirk Diggler. Interestingly enough, this is also where we see the genesis of porn studies, a field at the intersection of cinema media studies, sexuality studies, feminist theory, and sociology. Its interest in the porn star is immediately obvious. In the work of Richard Dyer, Linda Williams, Thomas Waugh, the porn star's figuration centers a budding study of pornographic aesthetics, the visualization of pleasure, and the distribution of erotic imagery. In the late 80s and 90s, VHS technology brings porn into the home, but importantly, it also expands the field of stars. Due to lower costs of production and distribution, studios and casts expand from what was once a relatively small group of makers to a wide but evanescent ecosystem. Stars come in and out of the industry faster than ever before, but they also have more opportunities to expand their performance to production, directing, and studio management. The early 2000s continues this in the switch to DVD and a half revival of porno chic, which sees porn stars like Gemna Jameson and Ron Jeremy on MTV, which sees more mainstream celebrities with sex tapes, risque videos, or just porny aesthetics. In this period, porn studies solidifies further, most obviously in the 2004 publication of the anthology Porn Studies, which includes our panelist Huang Tan Nguyen's article on Brandon Lee which would later be adapted into a chapter in its 2014 book, A View from the Bottom, Asian American Masculinity and Sexual Representation. Wen also directs in this period his film K.I.P., a collage film that remediates and interrupts images of the Golden Age star Kip Knoll. But something's changed about the porn star's place in our culture. The late 2000s and early 2010s see the rise of tube sites, diminishing profits, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and the total transformation of the porn economy into a gig economy. More workers, more flexibility, less pay from studios, shorter careers, and an unprecedented digital distribution. The recent rise of fan page and user-generated sites like OnlyFans only entrenches this gig economy even more, while bringing the promise of better and less mediated pay to performers who now double as directors, producers, agents, and marketers. In his Substack newsletter, Pro Bottom Book Club, porn performer and our panelist, Ty Mitchell, writes on the difficulties of keeping up with the quasi-erotic influencers, porn, for por porn performers putting out weekly content on fan pages, the demands of fans connected more than ever, and the awkward frustrations of fan page content's dissolution of the division between work sex and life sex. Add to all this, a new set of legal problems encapsulated in the 2018 passing of SESTA FOSTA, which gave serious legal teeth to longstanding campaigns against immorality and trafficking, and has made it so workers in the industry and the images they produce are increasingly regulated, censored, and condemned by the federal government and financial institutions. 
under all these changing conditions, there seems to be something passe, compromised, fragile, or just awkward about talking in terms of the porn star. And that's why we're gonna do it for the next hour and some. We seem to be having the sex wars again, but without the clear assembly of porn star texts to guide and divide us. And I'm always caught by the provocation in Heather Berg's porn work that porn studies have paid too much attention to porn and its stars as texts, as representations or aesthetics, rather than as laborers in a workplace. So what in the world do we do with all of this? My hope is together we'll get a bit closer to knowing. I'm excited to welcome Heather Berg, Assistant Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Washington University in St. Louis, Huang Tan Nguyen, Associate Professor of Literature and Cultural Studies at UC San Diego, and porn performer and writer Ty Mitchell for their opening remarks. And I was in a program that was pretty hospitable toward, you know, interest in that. And when it came time to do my senior research thesis, I was like, you know, I think I want to just like punk the institution and say fuck you to all you guys and make my research basically just me jerking off all the time. So I'm going to do a whole thesis about gay porn and, you know, make the this institution look at all these gay porn screenshots and basically like you know, see if they'll take this as valid. Um, but I'm actually really terrible at bullshitting anything. So I actually got really invested in it and wrote, you know, this uh, essay about uh, gay porn being uh, basically a legitimate um, archive or text for cultural inquiry and had a whole point about it you know, reflecting and refracting in what I called perverting uh, different anxieties that were brought on by the gay rights political movement. So I looked at a kind of gay military porn as this reflection of anxieties about don't ask, don't tell. And I looked at a film that was very like much about like a married man with this, you know, big fat wedding ring as a reflection of like the marriage equality movement. Um, and I was pretty proud of it. It went over pretty well. And, it, you know, it was in the undergraduate journal and I was going to kind of refine it and maybe set it up to be a writing sample for graduate programs, but I ended up not really just deciding not to apply to any graduate programs and became a full-time whore instead. And so going into porn, I had the kind of this like academic background and these kind of intellectual ambitions around what porn meant to me and what I kind of believed that porn did and could do. You know, I had this idea that porn is a really valuable source of sexual representation for queer people the way it was for me in particular. And so I saw a lot of possibility and potential in what, how gay porn stars could come to mediate that sexual representation to a public, especially, you know, as I found out through social media. Um, and so I wasn't really, you know, I didn't get into porn because I was like tight for cash or I was desperate or, um, you know, people were soliciting me or anything. I felt like I really actually had to fight to get people to book me at first. Um, but, you know, I got into it because I was starting to feel really confident about my sexuality and about my body. And uh, I really just decided I, I, I've like thought about this for a long time. I've always thought the porn stars were just really cool people, you know, like maybe not the best role models all the time, but I just thought they were cool. I thought they were kind of gay cultures, you know, rock stars. And, and I wanted to be one of those people. And I think on one level, I really wanted to have a platform from which I could write and speak and share more of my thoughts around sex and sexuality and provide a certain kind of representation. Um, and on the other hand, you know, I, I was, like I said, struggling to get booked at first and I didn't really feel like it was easy for studios to place me or kind of fit me into a type. And so I, I think looking back on it, I really wanted to distinguish myself as a personality and kind of build a fan base as an advantage toward getting booked. So, you know, there was a representational angle to my intentions around becoming a gay porn star. And there was also a very direct material one that I was hoping would advantage me and make me less kind of disposable or interchangeable, which is interesting because looking back on it, it's, you know, the interchangeable ones that seem to have the longer careers. Um, <laughs> But in any case, I, you know, was able to make a lot of friends, build a lot of great relationships and do a lot of cool work. Um, but at the same time, as I was, you know, trying to kind of build this fan base and this personality and trying to kind of represent, you know, be, you know, because my, my porn films were representing, I think they were 
teaching people in some maybe indirect way about sex and gay sex and pleasure and desire, but I also knew that there were a lot of gaps and uh, gaps in that kind of representation. And I felt that, you know, as a writer, I could try and represent some of the ambivalences and anxieties and, um, you know, demonstrate, you know, expand the realms of possibility for what a porn star could be, but also what a sexual, you know, gay person could be. Um, and so, it, since then, you know, like a lot of things have changed in the past 10 years, gay sexual representation or gay representation more broadly has like exploded, especially through digital culture. Um, and, uh, you know, even I had to succumb to doing OnlyFans, even though I have no desire to produce, direct or manage a studio, I've always just preferred to perform. Um, but it's kind of become this kind of like requirement, given the, the fact that we don't make, you know, residuals on our work in order to kind of sustain a livelihood. And, um, you know, I have started to feel like, you know, the reasons I originally got into porn to be this kind of particular kind of personality has kind of become obsolete in a lot of ways as so many people have taken up joining OnlyFans or just joining, you know, Twitter and, and being a sexual persona. What to me felt like kind of groundbreaking or innovative when I was doing it has become kind of uh, extremely commonplace, it feels like in my feeds. And so I've come to feel as though maybe porn stars as I knew them are becoming obsolete because they've been subsumed under the economy of influencers, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger as our you know society gets more and more precarious and more and more digitized and more and more, uh, surveyed, surveillanced, <laughs> you know, so on the one hand, I do feel like on, a, on an abstract level that maybe porn stars are becoming obsolete, but I also think a lot about subjectively, I've been doing porn for five years and it's not a very, it's a famously short career. And I am in a position personally where I am looking to transition to more sustainable work. And I wonder when we ask about the future of porn stars, um, how we can think about the future of actual individual porn stars and where those people go when they no longer do porn or when they no longer do sex work. Um, so that's kind of uh, a little intro to me and my work and my intentions and around, you know, being in the porn industry. But I also want to give a nod uh, to each of my uh, co-panelists because, you know, reading each of your books has actually very much bookended my, my relationship with the porn industry. You know, I read A View From The Bottom in late 2017, I think. Um, when I was really just starting to get into porn and starting to do the whole pro bottom moniker on social media, and it was extremely, I think, uh, validating of my point of view that I didn't have to be, or shouldn't have to be, you know, hyper masculine, or I shouldn't have to be even, you know, racially legible necessarily um, to find power or to exercise some kind of power. And I think it very much inspired me to to play with the ambiguities and the, you know, exceptionalisms and in, in the way that I was existing in the porn industry. And so I really, really, you know, appreciate you doing that work and, you know, publishing a bunch of gay porn screenshots like I was dreaming about doing it as an undergrad. <laughs> and then, you know, flash forward to 2021, as I've taken a big step back from the porn industry, Heather reading your book was really, really meaningful to me and I expressed it a little bit to you over Twitter. But, you know, I, I realized after reading it that I was working with a lot of you know internalized shame around being in sex work and being in this industry and it was really really uh, helpful to me to read you documenting all of these people and putting it in this labor analysis that reminded me of how cool what I do is and how punk it is and how much it aligns with my politics and my ethics and so it, it really meant a lot to me and it honestly pulled me out of a dark place so thank you both. <laughs> thank you Ty. Um, well, I invite Heather to give your opening remarks. Well, yeah, thank you so much for that. You're gonna make me cry. So that I'll start off on that, um, in that spirit. Um, but yes, as I said, when when you wrote me that tie, it was just um, like the, just the best feedback I could hope for. I'm such a fan of yours and your work and that absolutely made my day and my week. And um, yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm re really happy to be here with all of you. I'm, I'm just such a fan of everyone um, in this space. So yeah, thank you for bringing us together. Um, and I'm really looking forward to being uh, in conversation with all of you. So I thought I would um, start my, just with some brief comments. Um, I'm gonna just tell you a story, um, not about a porn star, but um, as Ty's talking about the, the, the folks who 
end up getting obscured. I'm going to talk about this from a different angle. Um, and this is a director who called me when my book came out um, and talked about his growing obsolescence. Um, and so I'm going to tell his story really briefly um, by way of getting us to the porn star. Um, so this yeah, director called me last spring. Um, I'd sent a copy of my book. And he said, we met um, and talked in, in 2014. And he said, we talked just before everything went to hell. Um, so this director had been, we met in his, uh, his mansion in the Valley. He'd been pulling a lot of money, um, turning out gonzo scenes. Um, as I mentioned, um, folks, the performers got no royalties. Uh, this director paid a day rate. Um, as they all did and do um, under that model, um, had total control over the terms of the scene, but also what happened afterwards, um, cutting up a scene, redistributing it, repackaging, repackaging it, and so on. Um, and we talked um, just a few years ago about that model. Um, he saw no sense that it was coming to an end, um, but he called me in, in spring 2021 and said he was now working, um, doing kind of piecework, ghostwriting for OnlyFans performers, um, pr pretending to be them for a small fee um, in their chats with fans. I don't wanna blow up anyone's spot. So if you're a fan and you're talking to someone, it's definitely the performer you think it is. Um, but um, so, so this director had been reduced to this kind of piecework um, because of the explosion of direct-to-consumer production. Um, and he said he wasn't being paid particularly well um, but this particular person was really good natured about it, um, more so than many of other former managers that I've spoken to who feel absolutely that they were entitled to maintaining that role um, really permanently, that there was something special about what they did um, and who at once uh, complain about being outsmarted and outfoxed by performers and also condescend to them at every turn. Um, but this particular director was good natured uh, in it, joking about how funny it was that these fans were texting with a 60 year old man thinking it was their favorite starlet. Um, and he said he would have done exactly the same thing if given the chance and acknowledged that this was what he was doing, some version of what he was doing before, um, paying as little as possible for as much work as he could get. Um, and so I start us there. Um, to think about um, what this really this crisis point um, for management as well as for workers um, and maybe after after this reveal for for some fans um, um, and my book really leads us up to that crisis point and then stops there. Um, I think the nature of academic publishing is such that we've caught up with ourselves and then uh, at, at the very moment that, um, that we submit something like a global pandemic happens um, or the march of digitization um, uh, comes on more strongly. Um, and so, so my book is telling a story about workers' um, contestations over their class position and really their struggle against work. Um, all of the hacks and strategies that they deploy um, in the service of trying to uh, relieve themselves of worker status, even as, and, and I'll just gesture back to, to what Ty was saying, many people don't have any desire to produce and direct, um, but the, the only opportunity for um, maintaining um, autonomy over one's conditions um, and also um, a greater uh, control over pay is to do so. Um, and so I'm really interested in, in what that means for our, our politics around class, um, that nobody wants to be a worker, um, that most performers would rather have no boss than one disciplined by collective bargaining or uh, better state policy. Um, and those are some questions for policy and for organizing, but I think also for porn studies. Um, so that's, that's where I'm thinking about beginning us um, this evening. And I'll just say too that this, this comes from a much longer history of uh, performers' strategies. Um, this is not, not new. I think, per, I think porn work has always been gig work and porn workers have always um, really prioritized these efforts to, um, to make porn star status such as it is work for them. 
um, sometimes to take more from the scene than it takes from them. And I think that there's a lot to say here about how that might change um, how we talk about exploitation. Um, I, I mean, economic exploitation at the point of the scene um, to the extent that, that the scene itself is more an advertisement for side hustles than uh, than a scene that, that can be understood on its own terms. Um, so I'll just close really briefly um, by quoting a uh, performer, Samantha Grace, who I engage in my book, um, who says, you have to do other things to make money. Film work is a form of marketing. I work with other companies so I can promote my own website, my own films, my own custom videos, pro doming. Um, and Grace's description of how she came to the work in the porn industry uh, I think matters here. She chose sex work as an alternative to low wage retail jobs that left her thinking, oh my God, I'm never gonna get out of this. And this really helps contextualize her approach um, with retail work meant feeling trapped and sex work entrepreneurship promised a possible alternative. It was important for her and it was important for a lot of people um, that I interviewed to refuse to limit themselves to the forms of porn work that in making money for someone else look most like retail, um, look most like the straight jobs that they'd left. Um, so I'm thinking about how crucial these strategies are for those who face the harshest conditions when they do work under a boss, um, racialized performers, trans people, people with disabilities, all have really good reasons not to want to be workers. Um, and as others have gestured to, I'm thinking about how brittle this strategy is in the face of censorship um, policies like fosta sesta and some of the struggles that you all are probably familiar with and I'm sure we'll get into more um, around access to banking um, and just the ability to get paid. Um, so I'll leave us there, but I'm looking forward to a conversation. Thank you so much, Heather. There's so much on the table and I think I wanna start by probing a little bit deeper into something that I think all of you have talked about, which is the kind of um, social mediaization, <laughs> to put it one way, the social media form being adapted to the pornographic form. Um, Ty, in one of your newsletters, you write, um, to understand these pages, meaning fan pages, you must understand them as the convergence of two hyper-individualized freelance career paths that few take seriously, sex work and social media brand. In fact, the transition of thirst traps into amateur pornography illustrates the thin boundaries between sex work and social media, on the one hand, and what was already always already pornographic about social media, that is the public expression it gives to private desires and their satisfaction on the other. Um, so I guess what I wanna ask is, when we talk about pornography taking a kind of social media uh, form or what Ty put as the star system being kind of subsumed under the influence model, how might we say that changes the kind of erotic experience um, for, and I'm gonna put that two ways, for uh, viewers or for audience members or for stars themselves. I think Ty has written quite cogently about how it shifts the erotic experience for the star or the performer um, themselves. And I'd invite any of you to take that or not take that, whatever you feel. Could you could you just crystallize the that question a little bit? Yeah. Like the short for the short version is how does that social media model change that we've been talking about affect the erotic experience for either viewer, performer, whoever you might be talking about? I see it as not an easy one, but what I like about asking that question is actually, I think Ty, just to target you for a second, yeah. I think you've written quite well about this in the sense that um, one of the things you say is social media already feels erotic, difficult, uh, vulnerable, and that a lot of people who are not actually what we would call sex workers profit off of a slight eroticization of their social media pages, right? Like thirst trap, or uh, let's say a kind of like, approaching but never quite getting to a, a sort of pornographic page. One of the things you say is that it struggles, it makes a struggle for um, a performer's 
sex life in the uh -huh. sense that uh, the work life division becomes much unclear uh, than it was before. Um, in the sense that no longer are you working, say, twice a month, as you mentioned before, but you might be kind of constantly working as a marketer, as a director. Um, you seem to have no boss, but you now have this kind of imperative to kind of constantly be creating. Um, so I'm wondering about how that's affect that how, how that might affect a performer. I'm also wondering how that might affect a viewer who now the relationship to a porn star might not be scene based and is definitely not theater based as it was in the 70s. Now it seems to be kind of scrolling through. It seems to be constant, it seems to be atmospheric. There's me adding some content. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with OnlyFans, you have this um, absorption of liabilities and therefore of all these different kinds of skill sets that otherwise belong to a bunch of different people. And I think I've struggled with that a lot and I think written about it a little bit about how challenging it actually is to um, hold a camera really towards someone who is supposed to be dominating you. Um, and so I've run into a lot of challenges, just technically speaking around like um, fitting into that director role while also being a performer. And, you know, there are plenty of other people who are on OnlyFans who are, you know, bottoms who seem to get the footage that they need and don't seem to have the, the total breakdown that I do. But I do, you know, there, there is a completely different kind of set skill sets between being a, a performer on a set in a studio uh, for a studio bit for, for a, a studio production then from self-producing things and one of those you know skill one of the one of those skills that uh comes with only fans is recruiting people and scheduling people and the kind of all the logistics of making sex happen in front of a camera that you know i'm used to not being responsible for and i would even say i got into porn in order to not be fucking responsible for <laughs> you know i was like oh great no one's gonna flake on me because there, there's a check behind it <laughs> Or someone else is dealing with it, you know? So so uh, I think to answer your question in, in part, you know, I think it's changing the erotic language of the porn that we see as it's increasingly amateur um, because it's increasingly working with, you know, uh, uh, people whose skills lie more in making putting people in a room together than on you know uh playing to lighting um providing a lot of you know uh oral cues uh or verbal cues or um just like you know knowing how to knowing how to work with it with a camera is something that like i've you know i gotta get lost in translation and going from studio work to, to doing amateur work and so you know those production necessities and accidents and circumstances i think affect the actual porn that winds up on our feeds which is increasingly you know um it's harder to find good money shots these days <laughs> you know mm -hmm. that's my take that's great that's great um heather huang do you have any? Oh, yeah, I, I find uh, Ty, Ty's comment fascinating. Um, right, because just because you are, you know, uh, performing at the bottom doesn't mean that you actually, you know, are, are actually necessarily equipped to uh, represent the view from the bottom. So I think that's, <laughs> so I think that's fantastic. So I think, you know, uh, one of the pre-question you sent us, Gabriel, I, I, lo I loved uh, all of them and I... I, I I type up quite <laughs> responses. Yeah, so uh, the idea of, um, right, uh, representational politics versus label politics. So I think you know, this is my, I felt that you know, I was totally like uh, addressed <laughs> by that question, being on the representational side, you know, as a humanities person. Um, right, so I think it's, it's um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of how a scene is shot, right, uh, even you know, on OnlyFans, uh, uh, is is so important in terms of how um, you know subscriber viewers right uh, consume it right so uh, ties uh, ties uh, description you know uh, uh, thick description <laughs> um, is is really really helpful um, right so in terms of so is it you know a, a stationary camera right uh, uh, you know medium shot right or is it you know uh, multiple cameras right in terms of the cell phone. Right? Is it uh, from the person who is getting fucked, the person who is, uh, you know, a, a omniscient point of view, who is, 
you know, uh, hovering around the, the two people who are fucking, or it could be three or four people with their own individual phones, right? Or cameras, right? Uh, uh, involved in the production of this uh, clip. So I think all these different elements, you know, contribute to how the scene is read, right? How is it convincing? How is it sexy? How is it compelling? Um, yeah, so I've never had the privilege to experience this yet, but I hope so in the future. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, uh, right, so I think, you know, what, what, what Ty shared, I think was really, uh, really uh, enlightening. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, representational uh, analysis, you know, uh, um, is still, you know, uh, has place in porn studies. So I'll end there. I'd love to hear what Heather has to say about this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'll say, I think, you know, the, the um, critique I try to make in the book isn't the, and, um, and I think, yeah, in your, in your initial question was that I suggested that it's, it's passe or something. <laughs> I don't, don't want to suggest that, but I think um, what, what, what was striking to me and starting to wade into porn studies as a field was just that, that I can't think of another um, media industry that has been so uh, uniformly treated as though what you see on on screen or here um, uh, tells the story of production. Um, and so that was the thing I wanted to correct rather than that I don't want anyone to, to do representational analysis ever again. <laughs> so I will say that. Um, but I, I am really struck by um, um, but as you're talking, um, you know, about all the, these questions of, of camera angles and the money shot and, um, and by how much work is required to produce a shot that, that reads as authentic to the viewer. Um, and I'm really interested in um, how all of that gets politically loaded, um, particularly for viewers who are uncomfortable because of sex work stigma and porn stigma with the exchange on its own terms um, and who I think have absorbed a lot of anti-porn feminists um, messaging about what it means to view. Um, and so uh, I, I'm really interested in this kind of um, uh, unexpected alliance between anti-porn feminists and uh, viewers who are maybe feeling good about feeling bad um, and uh, how both of those together um, can align with, uh, with managerial prerogatives that would also um, suggest that, that workers um, uh, do the extra labor of performing authenticity is something that I, I try to wrangle with um, in the book. So in terms of what that looks like under current conditions, um, I'm really struck by uh, how much self-production doesn't read as authentic to some viewers um, because it doesn't have the, um, the kinds of visual signals that uh, self-claimed ethical uh, producers have often deployed. Um, and so I, I think we're at, at a really um, fascinating uh, tipping point there um, in terms of, of the demands that viewers will will or will not continue to make of performers um, around performing authenticity, uh, performing real orgasm. Um, and, and I'm interested to see where that comes next. Yeah, well, thank you. to that because, you know, um, I, I mentioned earlier how part of what's been difficult for me adapting to kind of this whole OnlyFans landscape is mm -hmm. that the kind of personality or niche that I was trying to, you know, carve out for myself several years ago feels a lot harder to uh, enmesh with the kinds of personalities that now fill my, my feeds. You know, and a lot of those people are my friends and people I respect and, and really admire, but I've struggled a lot to kind of um, perform the personality that appeals directly to consumers. Whereas before I was able to kind of mouth off a lot more and felt as though I had the liberty to share a lot of my political positions and, and ethical positions, you know, and, and say more risky things because they weren't directly affecting my paychecks in the same way that they are now. Whereas I feel like it, being a performer on OnlyFans and, and having a social media personality asks of us to, to play this role that is, you know, constantly horny and exhibitionistic 
and you know a little dirty and edgy and um but also like subservient to you know subscribers and, and someone who who's working really hard to try and give subscribers their you know 8.99 worth um and so that kind of performance of authenticity that i was used to having on sets you know in front of the camera for a kind of you know, finite amount of time now feels stretched across my entire social media persona, which, you know, is something that, you know, I took pride in being able to be a lot more candid with. And I struggle to feel like I fit in with a lot of my peers who I think have an easier time, you know, um, performing this, this kind of, you know, likable social media personality that is just distinct enough to get noticed, but still, you know, uh, uh, falls into this kind of standardized type, you know? Yeah. That's great. That's really great. And I, I think I want to kind of follow up on Ty, your last comment and Heather's about authenticity. I mean, so OnlyFans sort of makes this promise that something that you're seeing is more authentic or more ordinary, that the sex you're watching is just sort of that person's life. And they would, I mean, and I, I think Ty's already cued us into why that seems a little bit false or extremely difficult to actually perform well. What's funny is like, as we have this rise of amateur porn or, or quote unquote amateur porn and quote unquote authentic porn, we also have a, a visible rise in sex worker advocacy um, by sex workers themselves, by others as well. And I guess I'm wondering if you think these two things are related or possibly trouble each other. So we seem to get this like view of into the lives of uh, sex workers, of, of porn stars or of OnlyFans creators, um, which we've already gotten the sense is compromised. But we also have uh, at the same time, like more advocacy and more regulation than ever before. So we're dealing with this like big knot. So I'm wondering if you think these kind of imperative towards the authentic and the push for a certain kind of advocacy are at all related or if they feel like two just oddly simultaneous things. And I think I'm going to actually, I'm going to invite you, Heather, to speak to this first, if you have thoughts on this, because I think your chapter on authenticity is a really great part of what I would call this sort of, um, I don't know, this discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I do think there's a connection there. Um, I think that, that again, part of that is um, around the, the performance of, um, you know, guilty pleasures on the part of, of viewers and also the regulators who are doubtless viewers. Um, and so the, the kinds of performance um, of, of activist authenticity, but also, you um, uh, sexual authenticity on screen that that requires. I do think that those things can be and should be understood in parallel. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's true for, I think, a lot of performers um, that um, that a particular kind of activist persona um, has to be really finely um, and delicately tuned according to the demands of the market as well. Um, and this is, um, yeah, I mean, I think as, as Ty was saying, like that's not a set of demands that existed um, under the studio model in the same way. Um, and I do think that, that that has something interesting to say um, to the, um, and I don't want to stick us in the sex wars, but to the, to the anti-feminists who like imagined that producers and directors had this kind of all-consuming power um, to really like return to how brittle that was and how um, dependent it was on um, on access to the stars who had you know who had names that traveled far beyond um, any individual scene or studio, and I think that you know the fact that that's not true. Um, you do have this proliferation of you know what a million little bosses um, in fans and. Uh, and I, I, the ways that people um, navigate advocacy in that context, um, I, I don't think there's a parallel in, in straight work there. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really surprise me that, you know, more advocacy and activism goes hand in hand with more repressive policies. I think that's kind of this interplay that we see like throughout 
you know, the history of sexual norms and, and mores is, you know, crises in like, you know, capitalism or, you know, the state, like take, you know, sexuality becomes the site, the arena for them. Um, but I, oh, totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, I was, oh yeah, you know, I was also going to say that I think we're also maybe witnessing, um, a, you know, a shift in the tactics that, you know, um, of, of, I don't know if I want to call it like late capitalism or, or, you know, the state in terms of how it's managing dissent, not through, um, well, simultaneously through criminalizing it, but also through so thoroughly saturating the amount of voices and the amount of content that exists to us that, you know, the dissent becomes neutralized through its just hyper proliferation, you know, and I think that we see that in all kinds of ways, you know, in social media, even, you know, with the examples that Wong brought up of, you know, we were seeing this unprecedented expansion of representation of Asian American gay sexual figures or icons. And at the same time, you know, so the 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 what it means to be a porn star becomes neutralized and neutral, more and more neutralized. You know that the that all these people have these huge followings, and yet they exist in a context in which they are sharing a stage with whoever else is on the feed, rather than being you know on a huge banner ad as you know the porn star of the year. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think we we see this in a lot of ways. I think not only through you know porn and sexual politics. But more broadly, that that dissent is managed through, you know, just overwhelming people with with voices, such that you know it, it becomes the part of the private corporate platforms to select who actually gets to be heard. Um, that, yeah, yeah, fantastic. I, I I'm really <laughs> loving this conversation. Um, but uh, bringing uh, back to what Ty and, and Heather just said, uh, authenticity, right? I think you know. For me, uh, authenticity in porn is such a tricky uh, issue, right? Um, one of my favorite chapters in your book, Heather, is you know a queer and feminist, you know, sort of work. I don't, I don't think you use that word. Thank goodness. Yeah, but the idea of work porn, right? Or fair trade. I think you might have used that word, fair trade porn. Right? Um, is yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'm very allergic to that kind of uh, you know gesture. But you know, as, as your uh, fieldwork points out, right? It's more exploitative, right? In terms of you know working conditions for queer feminists, you know, folks, you know, engaged in the porn industry, uh, because you're you're there because you love you love it, right? Labor of love versus you know showing up doing the work, and you know, okay, five o'clock, you know, I leave, right? So I think authenticity, the performance authenticity, the commodification of authenticity, right? Intimacy uh, needs to be, you know, uh, interrogated, right? And I think, you know, of course, you know, this is what OnlyFans and, you know, similar, you know, offshoot sites are selling. But, you know, I think, you know, um, yeah, it, it needs to, you know, I, I, yeah. So I, I, also in terms of, you know, say, uh, in terms of film media studies, documentary has been, you know, uh, debates in documentary, you know, uh, uh, studies has been you know, uh, uh, going on for a long time in terms of authenticity, who gets to present, you know, to represent whom, right? And the power dynamics in that, you know, in that uh, uh, context, I think very, very also, you know, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, present in, in, in porn, you know, uh, uh, production as well. Uh, so, yeah, so I think, you know, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, skeptical, but also, you know, I'm also fascinated by, you know, the, uh, you know, well, a lot of it is to do with, you know, I, I'm obviously it, it's to do, it's very gendered, right? So I, for, to do um, um, research for how <laughs> Zoom being the scholar that I am, I need to do something, you know, uh, right. So, uh, you know, all these New York Times op-eds that's been coming out uh, the past year and a half, right? Um, right. So, you know, selling, you know, intim intimacy, selling accessibility, selling proximity, et cetera, right? So uh, in terms of only fans, right? Uh, so uh, for me, you know, I, I don't quite understand. I mean, okay, this is maybe a naive uh, a statement, but yeah, the, the connection between, you know, so I'm really, I really do know this, you know, uh, porn star, 
porn celebrity. They know my, 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 my birthday. They know the name of my pets, my children, et cetera. Right. So yes, I'd love to hear from Heather and also Ty, Gabriel as well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what do you make? Yeah. I, I'm still trying. I'm struggling with this. Yeah. For me, I'm so skeptical as a, you know, as a, you know, film studies person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't understand this, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, appeal of, you know, um, you know, the real access to the authentic person, et cetera. Well, uh, Heather, do you have a response to that? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I think um, for me, it does, it does come down to, um, to sex work stigma. And I, I think that, that that helps explain what, what's different in this context. Um, and and um, and that it's I mean, the irony, of course, is that the consumers uh, require all this additional la labor to soothe the guilt about consuming labor. Um, but but for me, that's what's going on um, on here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that the critique of the feminist and queer wokeness <laughs> landed for you. It it, it uh, pisses a lot of people off. So uh, so I'm glad that it was all right. Um, for you at least, but I guess there's one thing I want to um, add to this conversation around um, around OnlyFans marketing the authentic is that that for me, the platform follows the strategies that that performers had already articulated, um, rather than uh, in the style of like it's all often you know compared to an Uber maybe. Um, but whereas I think in, in elsewhere in platform capitalism, you have um, this kind of disruption um, from, from the app developers um, down. But I think here, like this is so obviously derivative of the strategies that per performers had, um, you know, have been playing with since um, the 70s in terms of, of uh, making content available that feels realer um, to, to fans. Um, so I'm interested too in, in that. Um, and what, what makes this context different? I think um, at the time that we have now, I wanna start weaving in some of the viewer questions. Um, and there's a lot of questions, so I promise I, I, I will try to get as many as I can. I hope that I get some good ones in. Um, I think I wanna start because it's pretty relevant with a question from Walker Bird, who mentions OnlyFans recent announcement that they were going to ban content depicting sexually explicit activity and then the reversal of that policy. I mean, we saw this not get reversed on Tumblr even though it didn't really quite work. Um, the, the direct question is how should porn performers going forward adapt to an industry whose future is more uncertain and where the platforms they promote themselves can be erased in an instant. But I also just wanna add um, to that, this is also a massive archival problem for scholars, which is like, the digital pretends to be quite permanent. It pretends to be always accessible and it's actually quite the opposite. It's incredibly evanescent and um, can fall apart for the most arbitrary of reasons. So I guess the question is really how we adapt to the tenuous sort of nature of, of digital and digitized porn. Pong, I think recently I targeted both Heather and Ty. So I'm starting okay, with you. Sure, you right. I, I, feel, well, I feel like Heather and Ty have much more expertise in, in, in this question. But uh, right. So, I mean, so I, I'm drawing on, you know, the, the amazing insight of folks like Susanna Pasonen, yeah, and her recent work on uh, the, the, the platform, the, the platforming, right? Um, right. So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, folks, you know, uh, sex workers themselves, you know, who have engaged, uh, 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 you know, uh, on uh, OnlyFans platform, have suggested how vulnerable, you know, so the, the you know, the phrase, you know, the, the concept uh, of platform capitalism, you know, uh, uh, com comes in you know, as a very useful rubric here. Um, right. So, you know, uh, uh, as we saw with Tumblr, right, the, you know, super meaningful right, uh, uh, the investment of this queer youth of color, for instance, right, with Tumblr, right, with a, you know, I mean, uh, they, they did uh, provide advance warning, but, you know, all that, you know, uh, uh, effective labor, right, or and also just, you know, the time and commitment that folks, you know, pour into 
you know, those, uh, forming those kinds of, you know, uh, uh, relationships disappeared, right, overnight, right? So um, I think with OnlyFans, you know, I think, you know, that, that, that is the risk, right, with that announcement, and then, that, you know, they walked it back because of the backlash. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, I think the, the um, so I think it's, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, just, uh, um, just, just, just for fans, no. I'm forgetting the uh, <laughs> just for fans for my fans like right? these these alternative uh, um, you know platforms uh, you know uh, rose up so I think um, it's it's uh, important for so you know more sex worker you know uh, uh, um, platforms right uh, 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 that that came out of that uh, announcement I think is is uh, is excellent right so yeah so I know that Heather and Ty have much more. <laughs> <laughs> enlightening insights. So I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that that all went down in what, like, over like three or four days, maybe a week, this past summer. And, um, you know, I was, I kind of held off on joining OnlyFans initially, when a lot of my peers in the industry were doing it, because I felt really distrustful of the platform and the company. I was just like, we don't know who this is. Like, we don't know, like, you know, they could just like drop you at any time. People, a lot of people were having delays on their payments. A lot of people were having credit card processing issues. Um, a lot of people were just, I, it took me like three months to even get like my profile approved, you know? So I was really distrustful of the platform from the beginning. And so I've always been very cautious around trying to rely on it um, really, you know, exclusively for a livelihood until COVID happened. And then it just kind of went down that way. Um, but even still, I've like always, I think, had one foot out the door with it. And, you know, like I, I don't like it. I don't like doing it. I don't want to do it longer than I have to. And so for that reason, you know, when they announced that they were going to take down all the sexual content, there was to be totally candid with you, a part of me that was incredibly relieved because I was like, okay, we can move into the next fucking phase of whatever this is, you know, and, and see in where where this is going to go i wonder what's going to happen even though at the same time i did genuinely feel really upset and really terrified for friends of mine you know i have a friend who just had a baby who's making all of her money off of only fans you know and so i obviously was thinking of those people too um and how horrible it is that this platform and well all of these platforms that um can kind of suck people in and get them you know get us you know reliant on them and dependent on them with no real actual accountability toward us and that's you know a trend that transcends just you know sex work um and I think that, yeah, FOSTA SESTA was a really big wake up call for all of us who are, are we're already, you know, tapped into the sex work world and industry. Um, and it's unfortunate that, you know, it, it's odd that OnlyFans, I think part of its success was reaching out and marketing to so many people who don't consider themselves sex workers, um, who just consider themselves social media influencers or personas or whatever, who have been kind of pulled into, I think, you know, a logical progression and what they were probably already doing, um, but also a, a, a really precarious relationship with yet another platform that can't, that that is not actually accountable toward toward its own people you know so i at first switched to just for fans and even played stuff with for my fans but then i also ran into, issues, ran into issues with you know the people who run those sites um you know, it's funny because the flip side of like a shadowy company running something is like having some like public figure run something who can get into their own fucking mess of trouble that you know that becomes like extremely politicized so it's um it's been challenging and yet um you know, I, I try to like advise people not to really depend on it, but you know, like easier said than done as with all things, you know, sex work. And that's something I think those of us who have been in the industry long enough are more familiar with and that precarity is more familiar to us. You know, like I was an escort when the rent boy offices were raided and that I don't think I ever really forgot that. I don't think I ever got over that, but there are so, so many people who are not, you know, who, who started doing this after the, all of the articles about FOSTA SESTA, who are just not used to or aware of, or even have the ability not to depend on um, this platform. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just um, add really briefly that, you know, in terms of the historical memory piece, um, that I think that a lot of like civilians outside of, of this um, recent history sometimes forget too that, that OnlyFans explosion in the work lives of performers was itself a response to Basta Sesta, but also to this just kind of um, broader creep of um, of sites that folks had used to distribute more directly, um, often without giving anyone a cut. Um, as those closed down, then sites like OnlyFans that take, uh, I think, you know, a useless cut um, of people's earnings um, come to be empowered. So there's this this like brief moment in which people were using Skype, um, Google Drive, um, and all of these. Um, uh, platforms really creatively, you know, outside of their intended use um, to distribute without any middleman at all. Um, those get um, shut down because of FOSTA SESA and um, reactive responses on the part of platforms to, you know, potential future policy. And all of that has the most immediate effect of, um, of empowering extractive platforms to um, enact whatever terms of service they please. So I, I think um, I hope, you know, and I don't know, um, I, I don't think that policymakers are acting in good faith. So I don't think that it's like a matter of ignorance that can be corrected. But I hope that more people um, outside of this understand that that um, that those encroachments on the ability to, to distribute and communicate with people directly, even to use sites like Twitter to advertise yourself. Um, that their most immediate effect is is to empower um, the worst kind of managers. I want to try to simultaneously give you two questions that I think are deeply related. Um, I won't do any sort of conceptual work of combining them, but I think that the responses to both will be related. So first comes from Constance Penley, who asks, Heather specifically, please talk about how your study of porn work that notes the anti-work ideology among sex workers resonates with so many non-sex workers quitting their jobs post-pandemic. We'd also love to hear Tai and Huang comment on the force of anti-work ideals to them if they would like. I don't know if you guys saw, there was like a big article about anti-work um, uh, recently, I don't remember where. And I also wanna bring in Daniel Delmonico's question in, uh, oh, sorry, it's in our chat which says, um, I'm fascinated by Ty's thoughts on some of the things Heather brought up about the intersection of labor and porn. Would a porn stars union or something be a solution? How do we value the work of porn stars and pay for, pay for porn if not considering porn work? So on one side, we have a kind of anti-work sort of punk side of things. We also have a, the, the, this always gets brought up of the sort of like, can a union happen in porn? But I guess the question really, I hope either of those inspires us to talk a little bit about what the sort of labor horizons are for this kind of work right now. Should I start since kind of, okay. Um, uh, that's always the hard thing with these Zoom panels. I think no one wants to jump in first. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I think that more and more people um, can can hopefully you know begin from a place of empathy with with um, around what it means to to want not to be a worker, um, and and at the same time understanding that that porn and other sex work um, are often um, sorry my ring lights going in and out um, <laughs> are um, are often really um, you know historically. Uh, vaunted strategies for avoiding the worst of the world of work um, at the same time as particularly with uh, self-production, um, they feel more and more like clocking in. Um, so I think both of those things are true at the same time. Um, but what I'll say um, to, you know, to Connie's question about the links to, to work refusal in the pandemic, um, I don't mean to sound conspiratorial, but I don't think it's a mistake that these various um, policy assaults on sex workers' abilities to be paid um, are happening at the same time as there's a shortage in uh, those willing to do working class jobs. Um, that has, that, that there's a long historical pattern around that. Um, and, and I think it's not for nothing that, um, you know, that food service employers uh, in the capital state, for example, are experiencing a labor shortage crisis at the same time as the ability of particularly women and queers um, to, to strike out on their own is being undermined in policy. Um, 
And to Daniel's question, I'll just say really briefly, um, you know, I do think that the, the, the refusal to inhabit pure worker status um, brings up some really um, tricky and important questions for what unionizing might look like, uh, because the labor left has traditionally uh, assumed and, and really like desired uh, for workers to maintain their position as workers as subordinate um, in order to organize coherently as a class. Um, and so that's been a, a struggle for me thinking about this um, as a Marxist as how to how to talk labor struggle um, uh, with a community that um, that doesn't want to be laboring. So that's that's what I'll say. Um, <clears throat> on the you know topic of like anti-work ideology, you know that was definitely one of the things that really really resonated with me about Heather's book. And I'm very fortunate to uh, be friends with Connor Habib, who's you know quoted at the beginning of it, um, who you know early on in my born career was kind of a voice in the background, always saying like, I just want to read, write and have sex. And I just can manifest that and make that possible, you know, and to have that even be a possibility was something that really rocked my world um, in terms of like a way that I could, could live and uh, uh, you know, have a, have, have a life. And so, um, you know, I'll just say that, that that's that, that, that part of what makes porn work so satisfying to me is being able to explore different conditions for living in a society um, and and just you know being able to 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 bust some of those myths that I've been taught around what you're supposed to do and what compromises you're supposed to make but on the subject of unions you know I think I think Heather actually touches a lot on how um, you know, there are all these actually many, many more ways that workers uh, not only resist our managers, but um, collectivize or mentor or care for each other um, that, you know, fall outside of strict kind of union politics. And that because it has been such a challenge to try and organize um, porn workers or sex workers for the reasons that Heather just mentioned, that it might actually be more worthwhile to ask ourselves, what are the other ways that we can kind of collectivize and educate each other and help each other out um, other than, than unions? Yeah, I, I feel like this this is a fascinating, you know, really, really productive question, but I'm not sure I <laughs> can produce. Um, yeah, I mean, very, very provocative uh, uh, argument. Uh, from Heather's book, um, but I'm not sure if porn labor, you know, uh, you know, with the you know um, super detail, super you know uh, compelling interview that she did, you know, with this uh, uh, population uh, in her book, actually, yeah, um, we, you know, uh, provide uh, for me anyway an adequate answer to you know sort of like the the, the ethos of fuck work right or, or yeah so for me yeah I think you know uh, what remains to be unanswered or unaccounted for is what constitute pleasure in, in in porn work right because is it just work you know or is it you know people do it because they are you know they get off you know this is uh, and, and you know I, I, I this is the insight from from Heather's book right uh, you know how do how is pleasure deployed? Right or talked about, discussed, right? Uh, advanced, right? In 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 in, in this uh, these uh, uh, conversations and debates, right? So does pleasure override, you know, ethical labor practices, right? In terms of queer feminist uh, uh, porn uh, uh, labor, uh, or you know, uh, does it, you know, um, you know, override, you know, the um, the dreariness, you know, the oppression of you know, nine to five, you know, sort of work that, that you know, uh, many, you know, folks, you know, have to uh, uh, engage in, right? So I think, yeah, so I'm not sure <laughs> where I land on this, but I think it's very difficult in terms, because it's such such a charge, uh, you know, uh, 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 domain in terms of porn labor, right? Because sex, right? So how does one even perform, right? How does that register as, as work, you know, on 
uh, as you, we were saying before, representation versus you know uh, uh, you know the the production is you know a uh, production context of a porn work. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's yeah. I, I'm not sure there's a, a neat. I, I don't think there is a neat answer to to this question. Yeah, I would love to hear more <laughs> from Heather and Ty. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So, just talking. jump in really briefly to since Ty brings up um, Connor Habib, who's a yeah a mutual friend and, and comrade, um, and and to I think this earlier question about what representational analysis can offer a labor analysis and um, and I think I've learned so much from both of your work around this question um, and also this is something that that Connor often pushes me on is is that the stakes are different when we're talking about pleasure. Um, outside the context of straight porn, and um, and he has urged me not to to think pleasure within the bounds of um, the you know the tragedy of heterosexuality to, to gesture at Jane Ward. So um, so I do think that like the politics of pleasure are different in um, in the kinds of you know films that you write about, right? And um, and you both talked about like, what representation means in queer life, um, and I think that uh, that. I've been guilty of um, a tendency in in feminist writing on porn to to stay locked within the um, the the pleasurelessness of straight sex, um, and so I think there's more to say. Um, I also just want to shout out in regards to this question that Huang brings up. In 2016, we have twin books that come out from Muriel Miller Young, A Taste for Brown Sugar, and Jennifer C. Nash, The Black Body and Ecstasy, both of which I think are really thinking about what the pleasure of sex work is. Um, and actually, actually, we might, in this sort of false binary we've made about representation and labor, those books kind of fit there. Jennifer Nash, a little bit more on representation. Muriel Miller Young, a little bit more on labor. Um, but those are those are two really good books for thinking about this. and. Um, had we infinite time and infinite money, I would have them here too. Um, I guess one thing I wanna take up next is a really big question. Um, so take it anywhere you want, um, which it comes from Tao Nguyen, which writes, who writes, uh, what would be the future directions that researchers should or could take studying porn in this contemporary moment? So taking into account all the stuff we've said about the way this moment looks, um, I just want to add to that while people are thinking about what I think is a very large but really useful question. Um, Heather, one of the like things that I took to be a real like brain break moment in your book is the the a scene as a marketing tool chapter, um, which I believe comes from a quote from one of your interviewees, Dominic Fox. Is that right? Um, and a scene is just a marketing tool. I mean, this is like if you're coming into porn studies from the cinema media studies angle, that is a really big methodological uh, intervention in the sense that scene analysis, which for somebody like Linda Williams in the start, it, it, who's, who's hardcore is like considered one of these like founding texts for the field, I mean, she's coming out of like musical studies, like studies of the musical. And so scene analysis numbers is like huge for her. Um, it really builds a lot of the building blocks of the cinema studies approach. So when we think of it as like what we brought up about how scenes either in, in, a, in a film or in something like the videos that come out of OnlyFans, they seem to be kind of diminished in their representational weight, um, which is not necessarily to say personally, I mean, somebody can still have an incredibly erotic or passionate relationship to a scene, but simply in their speed, uh, simply in their disposability, the fact that they fall down the OnlyFans timeline or the fact that they pass on your Twitter or that they can be deleted in a moment's notice. So the question just to reiterate from Tao is what would be the future directions that researchers should or could take studying porn in this moment? Um, let's take that anywhere you want. And for the sake of pointing, I'm gonna ask Huang if you have any opening thoughts on this. Okay, right. So Linda was my <laughs> dissertation advisor. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, big fan of hers. Yeah, uh, uh, right. So I, I would say, uh, um, all right. So porn studies, I think I think uh, uh, Heather made a, a great point in her introduction that has, for the most part, you know, uh, very much devoted to, you know, uh, so sort of film and media studies, sort of disciplinary uh, framework, right? Uh, you know, analyzing uh, the text, right? Focusing on the text. There have been, you know, uh, uh, scholars who have, 
uh, taking into account production histories, right? Uh, in in uh, in terms of porn history, you know, uh, 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 you know, drawing on um, you know film studies, media studies uh, uh, models. Uh, but I think you know, in terms of going forward, uh, it needs to accommodate or adjust to right a much more expansive to media studies, new media studies, because it's not it's no longer right the uh, you know feature narrative film model anymore. Right, so it's it's uh, to do with the clip, the you know the the scene, the sequence, right? So I think you know it has to accommodate or, or draw into insights from you know uh, new media studies, uh, media archaeology around uh, you know what do right users, right, not viewers, not just spectators, right? Uh, how do they interact with uh, the 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 sequence, the clip, right? Uh, um, my students refer to all movies as clips these days. <laughs> That's very telling. Uh, right. So, you know, what do we, you know, in terms of sharing, liking, uh, downloading, you know, uh, legit or not, you know, uh, or, or you know, unofficial. Uh, yeah, so all these different activities. So it's, you know, more to do with social media, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a model, uh, you know, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and not just, you know, uh, the, the uh, sort of, uh, uh, hermetic, you know, film text that, you know, uh, film media scholars are used to, uh, uh, you know, analyzing as a discrete object. Yeah, I mean, I, I think going off of that, I think that I, I think there's more work to be done around the, you know, the history of viewing practices of porn and how, and re, you know, how they've, they've really changed dramatically recently. Um, I mean, there have always been people who, there's always been places where you can watch porn with other people historically, and especially in gay porn, or I don't know, I think even straight porn, you know, the porn theater is, was like such an extraordinary site for, for um, public sexual cultures. And then with the eradication of porn theaters and those kind of public sexual spaces, porn became something that we viewed very, very individually by and large. Um, and now we're actually seeing a moment where porn is once again being viewed in a more collective way, while also not, you know, through like the kind of interactive nature of social media, through the integration of sexual content onto a more, you know, uh, onto a feed of a bunch of other things, um, or even not if it's not on the same feed, just onto the same device and onto the same place. This whole notion of like getting caught watching porn on the, tr you know, scrolling past porn on the train, you know, while you're just going through your Twitter is a really like kind of, uh, radical change in how porn is viewed, which I think affects very much how it's uh, treated socially. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think clearly like academia trying to catch up to social media as it's changing so rapidly is, is always going to be a challenge, like, you know, Heather mentioned earlier. Um, but I think that that would be the future direction is to ha look at how social media is changing the way that people are viewing porn. And I think in the way that you are viewing porn, it is bridging these, you know, labor versus representational analyses. Yeah, someone will write that article, it'll be published in like six years. Um, then we'll, we'll get through peer review. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just add briefly. I, I think um, as the um, you know the media analysis side of this you know starts to to grapple with what it means to lose the auteur, um, and I think that that there's probably a lot more to say, uh, a lot more connections to be made with the kind of scholarship that's. Um, that we have uh, around the labor of artwork um, as such as one way. So I'm thinking about like Lee Claire LaBerge's um, Wages Against Artwork as one example of this that could be really useful um, for, for bridging that gap. So we are out of time, unfortunately. So first I need to just apologize to those whose questions I did not get to address, but I hope in the moving around all those answers, you felt something that got close to your question. Um, I wanna thank all three of our panelists, Huang Tan Nguyen, thank you so much. Heather Berg, thank you so much. Ty Mitchell, thank you so much. And I wanna thank the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality uh, for hosting us. Um, I don't have anything else to say. Kristen, do you have something you wanna say or should we say goodbye? I would just say thank you so much for joining us. And I thought this was really fantastic and I hope we can continue these conversations. So thanks for the willingness to do this. We really appreciate you. 
All right. Thank you all. Everybody have a good night. Be safe and uh, talk more about this soon. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Heather and Ty. Great to meet you. Thank you. you. So okay. good to be in conversation. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Bye-bye.